Looking further in the future, I see the emergence of personalized angels that will get the right information to the right people at the right time in the right language with the right level of detail, says Professor Raj Reddy. A very good evening. I'm Suvati, a PhD scholar in the Department of Artificial Intelligence, and I feel privileged to be standing here today welcoming the man of the hour for his distinguished lecture. We feel elated and honored to have you with us today, Professor Raj Reddy, one of the early pioneers of artificial intelligence and the first Asian to win the prestigious Turing Award. So we all with few prescribed to use admiration. With this, I invite our worthy speaker, Professor Raj Reddy, Honorable BOG Chair, Sri B. B. Arnold Reddy, and Narrator, Professor B. S. Murthy, on the dais. Please welcome. <laughs> Can we have the applause once again, please? Thank you. I request Professor Murthy, Director IT Hyderabad, to kindly extend a welcome address to the candidate. Today is a day where I don't want to speak anything, just want to listen to him, the person for whom we have been waiting for quite some time. I heard that he came to IIT Hyderabad when we were in the old campus, and definitely most of you who are sitting here have not been there in that old campus, and, uh, and definitely I also did not have a chance of uh, meeting him before uh, when he came to the old campus, but I had one meeting with him in 2014 in his office, and I can not forget that particular meeting. A person of his nature being so humble and uh, uh, one of the best human beings I have ever met in my life. So, so these are the only few words that I want to say. And uh, he said he started working on AI in 1963. I was not even born. Uh, so, so such is a person who is sitting in front of us today and uh, a leader in the field, a person who has made immense contributions to the extent that uh, uh, he attracted people to have uh, given him the Turing Prize. Uh, we, are, we are really, really fortunate that he has accepted our invitation in spite of not being in best of his health. Uh, and he said uh, he would come and bless all of us. And we are really looking forward to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, like that. Yeah, yes, like that. And now, we welcome Chairman Bioji for his presidential remarks to one and all. <laughs> Well, good evening to all of you. Uh, and I, on this special occasion, uh, I'd like to extend uh, a very warm uh, welcome to uh, Professor Raj Reddy. Uh, Dr. P.S. Murthy, B.S. Murthy talked about uh, him quite at length. And uh, you can uh, talk about uh, Dr. Raj Reddy for uh, time memorial. That's been the contribution that he has made not only in technology, but equally well as a human being. Uh, I'm sure you must have read his story where, from what humble beginnings that he started off. 
He was receiving the uh, Legion of Honor from uh, President um, Mitron, I guess. Um, and, uh, and he was saying that he started off first learning alphabets uh, by etching them on, in sand. That's where the beginning was. But today he is uh, ultimate in terms of knowledge. But more importantly, I guess, you know, what the big learning we have is his humility, his empathy, his kindness to people. I think it's extremely fortunate that we have Dr. Rajidi here. I wouldn't stand between him and all of you. And again, uh, let's uh, join our hands to welcome Dr. Rajidi. Hi. Thank you so much, sir. And without further ado, I welcome Dr. Monindra, HOD AI department, to kindly come on the dais and introduce our worthy speaker by throwing a light on his incredible journey to the August audience. Welcome, sir. It's an immense uh, pleasure and honor to invite Dr. Raj Reddy, Professor Raj Reddy, for a talk here. So, mm -hmm. Professor Raj Reddy is one of the pioneers in the area of uh, computing, computer science, and artificial intelligence. So, his uh, early research it was conducted at the AI labs at Stanford. And uh, first, it was as a graduate student, and later as an assistant professor, and then at CMU since 1969. So, his AI research concentrated on perpetual and motor aspect of intelligence such as speech, language, vision, and robotics. And uh, we all know how these terms are, you know, being used so much in AI research. But he started his work in 1963, and these were his major focus areas. So that uh, talks about, uh, you know, the kind of, you know, what he has introduced to the field of artificial intelligence. And uh, he was also instrumental in uh, helping to create Rajiv Gandhi University of Knowledge Technologies in India to cater to the educational needs of the low income gifted rural youth. So uh, he was the recipient of the Legion of Honor, Padma Bhushan, Ponda Prize, Vanity Award, and the 1994 Turing Award. And he was the he's the first person from the Asian origin to receive that award. And first of all, And it was for pioneering the design and construction of large scale artificial intelligence systems, demonstrating the practical importance and potential commercial impact of artificial intelligence and technology. So, with that brief introduction, I uh, would like to invite Professor Rajendra. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Such a pleasure to be back here. No, not back. I was I was there in, in the old campus ten years ago, but this uh, at that time I had an inkling of this new campus. I'm so happy to be here today. My talk today kind of has its origins about what we can do to help society in technology. How technology can help society. Over the period of 20 years, I've been experimenting with all various things, all around speech and language uh, and related things. So if, if, you, uh, if you say, I'm going to try to do something that will help you people, uh, you can do something in health. 
you should do something in education. Um, then there are two problems we have in this country, globally also. One of them is a language divide, and the other one is literacy divide. Turns out, if you're trying to use the internet and the World Wide Web and accessing stuff on your phone, if you don't, if you're not fluent in English, your ability to benefit from that uh, access to that knowledge is zero. You cannot benefit from it. And uh, it turns out technologies are at a place now. You know, any of you who have been using things like Google Translate or Microsoft Translator, and there's a, a new app called Boshini from IIT Madras, uh, which translates from Indian language to Indian language. All of these will have profound impact. But the problem is, how does it help a person in my village? I come from a village of 500 people, and there are a lot of people that can't read or write. There's many of them can't do, you know, can't read English at all and understand it. So the question was, how could technology help to overcome these two problems? Uh, if you look at the, uh, the situation today, uh, in India, uh, we have over 20 official languages and not having a unified communication medium is a significant impediment to the economic growth of the country. And there's a law, there's a, I think it's called Metcalf law. The economic power grows as the square of the number of people connected. In this case, Connected meaning they are able, able to communicate with each other. And in India, we have 1.4 billion people. Uh, if they are all can able to are able to interact with each other, we will be talking about 1.4 billion squared, which is a billion times billion, ten to the you know extra scale. Whereas right now, what happens is this population is divided. If you take somebody from Hyderabad and move north 300 kilometers and drop them in some village, they can't speak to each other's language, or south, or east, or west. East, of course, you'll fall into the ocean. But um, this is a serious problem. And uh, I think we already have the technical solution. What is missing is the frictionless use of this technology. What we need is, if, if I'm an illiterate person in a village and I have a phone, all I know is touch something and somebody showed me how to do that and then call my son or daughter. <laughs> So, thank you. What happens is if I have the same phone and I want to talk to someone in Delhi about the something that they're, they're speaking in Hindi and I'm speaking in Telugu, there's a problem. And it turns out if you're on two phones, now we have the technology which will listen to what I'm saying in Telugu and convert it into text in Telugu on the smartphone and then translate it back to uh, Hindi and the other person can hear it in Hindi. 
you know, uh, this is called the translating telephone. And it is doable, but it's not being done. The question we have to ask is, how do we get there? What is it that we have to do to, uh, my hope is to stimulate you to think about that kind of problems and then see, uh, maybe one of you will take on the challenge and then make it happen. It's not, it, it's, it's epsilon away from taking off and a breakthrough. And so, so the, the interesting thing is, this, this is the wire, power of viral communication. It turns out uh, in uh, 1995, there's a company called Netscape, which was started a year before and went public. And immediately it had no revenues, no history, no nothing. All that they said is we are building a web browser. And when in the day it went public, it's from the morning to evening, it value quadrupled or it went up by a factor of five. And, and similar things have happened. So when Steve Jobs introduced the smartphone in 2007, it was clear it was a major breakthrough. But none of us anticipated is the power of the Morse law and the exponential growth and how half the population of the planet would one day, not one day, 20 years, less than 20 years since it was introduced, everybody would have one of these smartphones and it would have more power than the supercomputers of the year 2000 in each form. So uh, my goal here is to kind of introduce you to these problems and say they can already be done, technically done, and you can go download it. If you're, you're all educated, you won't have any problem. But my problem is how do I make sure that an illiterate person who doesn't, can't read English, can't even read Telugu, can speak in Telugu, state the problem, and then get an answer uh, back in Telugu from someone who only speaks in And there are lots of other such problems, and it turns out uh, routinely, you know, if you look at our doctors, you know, many of the doctors don't come from this region or whatever region they're working in. They come from some other region and all the patients speak a different language. So it will be very easy to build a system in which everybody is hanging on to your phone, but I speak of my problems in Telugu and the doctor hears it in Hindi and then he speaks back and say, ask me questions. That whole dialogue can happen very smoothly. There's nothing stopping us from doing it. It has to be done. A, an app has to be built with all the things. There are two limitations of the current technology. One is the accuracy. The other one is the speed, latency. And um, so in order to kind of give you a very quick uh, update on what that, this means, where are the, what are the technologies involved, how did it happen, and so on, I thought I'll give you a little tutorial on speech-to-speech -speech language translation, machine translation. So over a billion people globally at the bottom of the pyramid cannot read or write. So what I'll show you is an example of a lecture. Let us say uh, we're, you're listening to my lecture in English and you don't understand English and you want to listen to it. 
in the future, you should just be able to sit here or at home and get the same thing trans translated with no friction. It should be a frictionless interface. And it can be done. But the question is, somebody has to do it. I'm too old, but all of you are too young, young and you should do it. And one of you, you know, can say, uh, there are multiple examples I'll give you of the kind of thing. And uh, with the technology we have, you can read any book, watch any movie, talk to anyone in any language, anywhere in the world. That is the opportunity. Let's take each problem separately. How do you read any book that's written in Russian if you don't know how to read Russian? Right now, what we have to do is find a digital version of the Russian. You can do that by scanning the book and then converting it into a digital copy, do an OCR on it, and then you have a, a Russian text. And now you can you know, use a translator from Russian to Telugu, and then you have a Telugu version of the book. But I can't read Telugu also, so I want to, to hear it. I can synthesize it. So that whole thing is possible technically, but I'm not sure how long it will take before we have it. But more importantly, necessary investments and apps have to be built so that what is technically feasible becomes routinely usable. And the same thing in the translating telephone idea I mentioned, Here's an example. Uh, let me show you some examples of this lecture. This is a lecture by Rick Rashid from Microsoft talking to Chinese audience. And uh, he's speaking in English. And then this was 10 years ago. So the technology was there for other languages 10 years ago, but only now becoming available for Indian language. Can you hear it? Good volume. Look at the delay from the time you say it to the time you hear it. And also, Rick is speaking very carefully 10 years ago, of course, so that if the computer recognition works correctly. Okay, so this is not magic, but there's still some warts and all that can be fixed. And ultimately it should be frictionless solution for everyone. And the European Union is using this today for translating between 24 languages of 27 countries. Uh, as anyone speaks in the parliament, the same thing is recognized in their language and then translate it into recipient's language, and I get to see it my way. So if there are 200 parliamentarians, each one of them gets a different translation, or, or one of the 24. So and that's happening. And uh, so the problem is, what is the magic? Where did this all this come from? How did it happen? It turns out uh, we need to take the signal from individual speech and convert it into text, sim signal to symbol transfer transformation problem, we used to call it. 
and that is mainly speech recognition. Once you have a speech recognition of whatever I'm saying in English, now it has to be translated into the language of the recipient. And uh, right now, the way that works is you have to manually go and select, translate it into Telugu or translate it into Spanish or something. But an AI system knows already who is the recipient, what are they doing? And so it, it shouldn't be at, you know, the, 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 there is a law that John McCarthy used to talk about. A computer should never ask a question for which it already knows the answer or can know the answer. And uh, anyway, so we have the problem of recognition, translation, synthesis, and dealing with under her spontaneous speech, not like what Rick Rasher was saying, carefully spoken sentences. So, what I'm going to do is kind of take you through history lane uh, over the last 60 years and show you some videos we happen to still have that kind of gives you idea of how it evolved. And I, you know, I, This is 1973. At Carnegie Mellon University, we have been working towards a system for speaking to computers. In this film, we will try to show the problems that arrive in getting a computer to understand speech. We all know that a native speaker uses unconsciously his knowledge of the language, the environment, and the context in understanding the terms. This knowledge includes the characteristics of the sounds, the stress and internet environment of speech, a dictionary of legal words, the grammatical structure of the language, the meaning of words and sentences, and the context of the conversation. To illustrate the problems of speech recognition by computers, let us examine the sentences we heard earlier and their inconsistencies with some of these sources of knowledge. These examples illustrate that the listener forces is only a duplication of what they hear and not necessarily what may have been intended by the speaker. Anybody because the subjects do not have the contextual framework to expect the words mobile together, they write more likely sounding combinations such as my deal or model. And consisting of four tasks with vocabularies ranging from 28 to 76 words. On the average, the system seems to locate and identify about 89% of the words correctly with all the sources of knowledge. Without semantics, the accuracy decreases to 67%. It decreases further to 44% when neither syntax nor semantics are used in the recognition process. In 1971, our semantics group of finalists who proposed a five year research effort towards the demonstration of a lot of vocabulary connected to speech understanding. <laughs> It is all the more interesting because it is one of the few examples in artificial intelligence research 
of a five-year position that wants him back real estate. With regard to the might and improving the best features of the two speed systems previously developed at Carnegie Mellon University, Pierce A1 and Brandon. Two features of the RP system led to a successful demonstration of the computational knowledge and use of new search techniques. First, let us consider some aspects of knowledge representation. The dynamic theory will be as we thought earlier, which is a vocabulary of 1,011 years. The use of space of the system, the veterans must perform the grammar and vocabulary for the task. Internally, RP stores all legal sentences in a finite state of graph structure. Here is a graph of a simple grammar. This knowledge is organized as a network of nodes, where each node will be word in the vocabulary. The nodes are interconnected such that any path through this word network. Constitutes an acceptable We're going to be demonstrating the yeah. You read a lot of the stuff. The videos are with Dr. Ruthie. You any of you can watch watch it. Examples. This is the Carnegie Mellon University. As we can see, I'm speaking continuously, not putting spaces between words. I said a third quarter profit of $25 million. So the system was trained for. The 38 million words worth of North American business news. So it's well tuned for receiving dictations on those kinds of topics. For example, this was the Octaker's first consecutive process of work. <laughs> Sorry. We're going to be demonstrating the Carnegie Mellon air travel. So these were the last two videos are from 1994, 20 years later. It took that long to get to where we are. And that's 30 years ago. And so, so it, it, the, it, all that says is when you're working on a very hard problem, for which we don't have any theory, no mathematics, nothing. It takes a long time to figure out what works and what doesn't work. And uh, the latest advance that happened was the deep learning uh, uh, technology, which improved the accuracy by about uh, 30 percent, which was a significantly better. Transportation in Denver. <clears throat> so, uh, once you have the speech recognition, now you have to translate it. It turns out translation also started in the 60s, and uh, there were lots of problems. People did not anticipate how difficult the problem was. 
and uh, we used to give this example of translating from English to Russian back to English of the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And the translation came back as the vodka is strong, but the meat is rotten. So that's the kind of thing uh, you, you will find even these kinds of things today. If you're using uh, Google Translate or something, you say something, it makes a completely incorrect interpretation <clears throat> because it does not have the, the knowledge and the data it needs to do the right thing. This is where the low resource languages come in. It turns out out of the uh, out of the uh, hundred or so languages that are spoken by 10 million people or more on, in the world. That is, there are 100 languages which are spoken by at least 10 million. It could be 100 million, like Telugu and Marathi and so on, or Bengali. Or it could be 200, 300 million for Hindi and English and so on. So uh, the low resource languages, so it turns out we knew how to do these things for a small handful of languages like, like English and Hindi, not Hindi, uh, Chinese and French and German. But Indian languages were traditionally ignored and nobody worked on them. And uh, as you saw, you need to collect a lot of data, the vocabulary, the, the lexicon, and the grammatical structures. So we need a lot. And, uh, the, at the last count, when I talked to people at Microsoft, they said we need for every new language 100 million words of text and 100,000 hours of speech. And so nobody's making an effort to collect that kind of data for uh, low resource languages like Telugu and Marathi, the reason is not that they're not important. <clears throat> 100 million people talk, talk that language. But, but there's no money to be made in it. It is not seen as a, a business necessity, business imperative. So that's why, uh, but slowly and steadily, we're now getting there, um, and uh, there are some new ideas and new technology of um, map between these things. And then we also had to work on synthesis, and uh, there are a number of examples you'll see here. Hi, everyone. Today we are going to see how it has been changing our lives. I've even been thinking of my new career after the book, and I found I found tech hyper brain. With you on that, I told you how the way of the iPhone would be so it is about. So I should pay Chama the Pandusia. With your head of Chama, with head of the Chama, show that we can't go. I just did that. What do you do? I guess, yeah. So you will be trying to see that. And you will do some things like in the world. See what we will still have a soon be a member. Don't know if you are a person. We are testing the strong for her to pay for you to remove children and get your children. Thank you. Anyway, you saw how good the synthesis is. It sounds like Obama. Today, we can create deep fake voices that sounds just like you or me that I didn't ever say. And, you know, if you want to get me killed, all you have to do is post something about Prophet Muhammad 
that I, I said something wrong. No. I never said. The problem is what happens when, you know, it, it is a major religious issue. And uh, we, we have to be very careful in the future of how, how to deal with these deep fake technologies. But coming back, so the unfinished agenda of usable speech-to-speech -speech machine translation systems, the, the first thing is, you know, it'll uh, clearly have a profound impact on society. We don't have enough data, and we also need to develop the technologies of self-supervised learning. And we don't have the necessary hardware. In order to be frictionless, it should be you know, an earplug in your ear, which is recognizing and synthesizing simultaneously. It, it, it can be done. The AirPods can do it. Apple might one of these days release it. But it turns out uh, we need the right kind of hardware. And we need systems that are sensitive to the needs of rural, illiterate people. So, to summarize, the vision of eliminating the language divide is to be able to watch any movie, read any textbook, talk to anyone in India, independent of the language of the producer and consumer. It can be done today, except we don't have all the necessary data to make it smooth and real time. <laughs> And uh, people like Microsoft and Google and Apple have the technologies and know-how, and we need to kind of bring them to the table in India. The literacy divide. Again, you can learn any skill on, on any subject at any time, anywhere, even if you cannot read or write. This is an important consideration. So suddenly you say, you're in the village and you say, you hear that there are some jobs for drivers. If only I knew how to get a, get a, to drive, learn to drive, I could get the job. So how do I go about, I don't know how to read or write. <clears throat> right now, the, the law says you have to have at least eighth grade to be able to read and write. I can't read. But I can learn to read the few road symbols. So we need to begin to change the law on what we have to do, and a whole bunch of things like that. And uh, the issue is something like a chat GPT guiding you can actually get you the skills that you need by watching videos of the, of the same problem and so on. So. Uh, using dialogue assistants like Alexa, so smart speakers. I don't know how many of you have used it to see Alexa. Can you raise your hands? Yeah, about ha at least half. You know, your city, I'm sure you've used it because it's on the phones. There's a similar one for Google and uh, Android phones. <laughs> so it's not enough to have those skills. To eliminate the literacy divide, you need connectivity and a smartphone. And the cost of all, all of that may be at the order of about ten thousand dollars, ten thousand rupees per person. You know, so if you could do all of that, then you can do on, and even people that cannot read or write can do online buying and selling open a bank account, which they cannot now do, answer what, who, where, when, how questions, and uh, access knowledge and information in Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a very good example. The number of Indians accessing encyclopedia of uh, the Wikipedia is 1% of the population in the USA that's accessing. 
per, per capita. What that means is educated people have a lot of need for additional information from encyclopedias. They run across some point problem, they need the knowledge, they can go to Wikipedia and then learn it. And then now, now they know what it is. If you have heard chat GPT, everybody saying it, you don't know what it is, you can go to Wikipedia and say chat GPT. But if you're illiterate, <clears throat> what do you do? And that's where we need uh, frictionless interfaces. <laughs> the most interesting one, long term, is entertainment and education. You were watching a streaming movie in Hindi. Today, you can essentially simultaneously translate it into Telugu and post caption. And simultaneously, you can also play it into your earplugs and synthesize. And uh, this, is not, this is not just entertainment. It turns out a lot of us like to listen to lectures of our own classes. What we listen to this morning, and we may need to go back and re-listen to it again. And this time, with the translation appearing below. And I think all of that. Uh, so all of this assumes the existence of an intelligent agent who can hold your hand and help you with literacy divide and language divide. Learning any skill you want at any time you want. And uh, with, it's what we call learning without a teacher. When you attend a class here today or tomorrow, a teacher who knows the subject gets up and tells you what you should know on that subject. But what, what happens if I don't have a teacher? Like Ekalavya. It's called the Ekalavya model, learning without a teacher. Turns out now it is possible. We just need to get there. So, one of the things you may or may not have thought about is Prime Minister Modi said we're going to be number three economy in five years and the number two economy in 30 years and so on. And that is based on the fact, India has the youngest population of any country in the world. And uh, if they can be gainfully employed, gainfully the key word, then they can actually uh, get to the uh, third economy and second economy in, in the next in the few years. But right now, US GDP is 27 trillion, China GDP is 20 trillion. We are behind Japan and Germany at 4 trillion. We, it's easy enough to go ahead like 6 trillion, a little bit more, and become a number three in a few years. But I think becoming number two is going to be, require a lot of heavy lifting. And that requires a lot of skilled, skilled is a key word. People that can learn new skills and execute the instructions with precision and discipline. And that's what I think we need uh, a digitally literate population. And what does that require? How do you get it? <laughs> digitally literate population. There are three slogans. Learning to learn. One of the skills you absolutely must have is when I come back and tell you that quantum computing is the next big thing. That's all I say. Now, if you're like many of the people I know, you have a laptop, you quickly type quantum computing, what the hell is it? And then it gives you some input. And then you follow it through after, you know, very quickly, uh, you know roughly what it is. And then uh, after spending a day or two, you're okay, you can have a conversation. 
So learning to learn is, are the set of skills that we need to teach in kindergarten, where if somebody doesn't know something, in the old days, you give up, throw up your hands and say, I don't know what to do. Now, if the kid is motivated, all they have to do is take their smartphone and speak. They think, what is this? And chat GPT will explain. That is the future. And that, that's why we need everyone to know how to learn to learn. And then once you learn to learn, you get some hallucinations and jump junk and some errors. You need to think. You need to learn to critically think and say, does it make sense from what I know? And uh, so, <clears throat> and learning to learn and learning to le think and learning to live, learning to live is very important too. I don't know how many of you can make rasam and sambar. When you go abroad, you all have to know how to do that. And otherwise you'll starve. And uh, so, uh, but that's because you, you never go into your kitchen. Your mom takes care of everything, you know. <laughs> but it's not just learning to cook. There are a lot of things that we take for granted that you need in order to uh, survive skills, learning by doing, you know. And one of the things we say is, everyone must know how to cook at least three dishes. Okay. I, if, if you can't, then you fail your BTEC. That's it. And, and so, and the same is true. It turns out many of the people that graduate from IITs and come to CMU and so on, have never seen a Shakespeare play. There's nothing in the curriculum that forces them to go through and listen to at least one Shakespeare. <laughs> the, the most recent big news about, of that kind is apparently there's a serious shortage of skilled workers to make semiconductor chips. At the, at the 10, micro, 10 nanometer level and 6 nanometer. And uh, unless you're trained and you're disciplined and understand everything, you have to follow everything to the dot, then you'll screw up the whole batch and thousands of dollars of loss. So with that, I'm saying uh, to, uh, to realize Modi's vision, we need population that's digitally literate, that can actually learn anything they need to learn on the fly. So empowering people at the bottom of the pyramid, speech is the only medium of communication uh, available for over a billion people. They can't read or write. And People at the bottom of the pyramid can use Alexa-like apps for talking to anyone, entertainment and education, buying and selling and for banking. And recent advantage, advances make it possible to engineer such devices, enabling everyone to read any book, watch any movie, and talk to anyone anywhere in the world. This is a big deal. Talk to anyone anywhere in the world in any language. Even now, when I say it, it sounds like a pipe dream. But I think we can do it. It's just a question of five or ten years. It'll be. It'll happen. We're at the tipping point. Of, so what we need is a universal translator uh, of spoken languages as the next engineering grand challenge for IIT Hyderabad's first engineering grand challenge. Thank you.
So you can follow this. Yes, Maybe keep that up so that if you want to take one of the questions. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. I'm sure that you are both mesmerized and motivated, many of us sitting here in the audience, to be inquisitive about problems related to speech. The learning to live is a phrase that I think is going to stick with most of us. And I hope we can make talking to anyone, anywhere in the world, make possible. The floor is now open for audience interaction. I would request everyone sitting in the audience to make the most of this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, go ahead. Actually, I don't have any questions, but uh, just to show gratitude to you. Uh, thank you for establishing uh, RGKT. So I'm a student of RGKT. Thank you for establishing this. Year. We always remember on your birthday. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you for your For those of you who know what, don't know what RUKT is, is a, a university we set up in a combined hour today in 2008, primarily to admit uh, rural students for higher education. We identified two or three bottlenecks. One was Women students were not going to colleges because their parents were stopping them at the 10th grade at the village level. And so they did so. So we, we changed the admission to a six year program uh, at the 10th grade. That had an amazing set of interesting uh, results as a result. Today, 70% of the kids admitted to RGK, they admit like 4,000 in Andhra and 2,000 in coming, 6,000. 70% of them are 7 0. <laughs> what that says to me is women are much smarter than men. So might as well accept it. And the second thing we did is uh, we wanted to give some, it turns out if you use the marks at the state level exam, or, then if you have good education, good parents who gave you good guidance and, uh, and you went to that private tuition, and if you spent on 100, so the marks are not necessarily the right metric for identifying talented people. So the question was, how do you find the talented people without a man? So what we did was we kind of used the geographic equity first. We're saying in a small population of a mando, the chances are everybody is more or less the same. And therefore, picking the best student from them is fine. So what we did was, rather than selecting people based on the marks for the state, we selected people based on the mark at the mando. And we said, we're going to pick two BG, yeah, two OC, one Y and one R, and one BC and one SCS, including graduation. <clears throat> that has worked out fantastic. And uh, the next, and the third thing we did was introduce the concept of deprivation score. The idea was if you were went to a 
private school or residential school, chances are you got a better education and your parents probably could afford it. Whereas if I went to local Java virtual school, sorry, I'm not, you know, that uh, I can't afford anything better. And the facilities and the teachers and everything are comparatively lower. And therefore, you end up getting lower caliber education. That doesn't mean I'm stupid. It so happens I went to one of those schools, the Lapras School in Kalahasti. But fortunately, I ended up in Loyola College afterwards. It took me six months to understand the English, but ultimately I got I know, survived. And uh, when we don't get it up, so what he said was, uh, this was the chief minister at the time, by his side. I said, you went to a village from my village, and I'm going to stay. We're black sheep. We somehow escaped from that uh, thing. And what, there were these three or four people in the village that were as smart as I was. My class. What do you mean by that? Well, that's the democratic division. The these people, for economic and other reasons, never leave the village. And so, in this particular university, everything is free. Tuition is free, food is free, clothing is free, shoes are free. Everything is free. You get a laptop, sorry. Laptop, everybody gets a laptop. And uh, it proved to be amazing because those that are more fit, very quickly learn how to use a laptop or figure out what kinds of things. Including you know, browsing the web and getting in trouble, but uh, downloading movies and so on. But, but that's important we need to know people to become digitally literate and competent, and they learn from each other, not from us. So, anyway, that's our GPT story. Thank you. Here, though I didn't want to speak at all in front of her uh, because I'm a great beneficiary of this RGUKT. At IIT Madras, almost every year I used to get four students as summer interns to me. They all used to become my PhD students. One of them is sitting here. So one of them in 2020 when PMRF was very tough, the final number of PMRFs possibly here. Those days, it was through an interview, two levels of interview. Uh, she was the topper in metallurgy. RGUKT student once again, comes from a very poor background. And she became my PhD student. I'm fortunate to have her as my PhD student. Another student of mine, RGUKT once again, is a Humboldt fellow. I could never get Humboldt fellowship, and he got Humboldt fellowship. Thank you, sir. You are. We have really transformed lives of so many. Thank you very much. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Thank you so much, first of all, for the, such a great talk. Okay. Uh, my question is a more technical one. You, you spoke about seamless translation of one language to another language, where one side of the phone spoke any Telugu that can be seamlessly translated to uh, Hindi or some other language. And that includes the trade off between accuracy and the real time performance. Uh, my question is more on the other side, which you also spoke the security and the privacy aspect of it. So, in someone speaks our voice and the way we speak, because there are different dialects and uh, the accents are different. So, someone steals our privacy and the security uh, our, our data and uses it in a different way. So, uh, what's your take on why such solution is not coming forward? Is it because people are afraid of developing a solution that can be taken? I think the is not happening. It's simply the technology is not quite there. It will happen, fortunately, two, three, five years, maybe 10 years, the maximum. 
security and privacy will always be there. <laughs> it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be because I'm, I'm speaking to you instead of going to your presenter draft or something. It's simply because somebody maliciously is capturing the data. What we need to do for that is make it a crime, make it so that people that are caught have a severe consequence. And the European Union is leading, leading in this area. You might look at what their 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 punishments. Yeah, general data regulation, the protection regulation. So my question is: once our data has gone online, it's not in our hands. So, so in the particular case I'm thinking about, that's not the case. What you think of WhatsApp? WhatsApp and fix everything. So all I'm saying is, well, let's speak into, and uh, you hear in English, let's say, what my spoken Telugu's identity converted into encrypted message in talks and do you receive it and translate it into your language we got here in the or something that there's no 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 one else even whatsapp doesn't have access and that's what we need to do we can do it but see the long-term potential they're not just talking to each other, but talk to each other with the purpose <clears throat> where we are you are giving me some skill or I'm asking you some question back and forth so that we are able to kind of improve ourselves, self self-improvement, or kind of help, help each other. You may want to learn too, and I may want to. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Well, in India, we have taken a stand. We teach people English. We are the largest English speaking country in the world. So, all these languages are much more adapted. And we do have a lot of, um, in every single website we go, we see the, those policies in these regional languages. But never in Hindi, if not Telugu, Tamil, Malayalam, and other languages. Uh, so, where is it going? Where, where, is it, where are we? Um, where is that? That we do not have such models in our digital languages. The reason we don't have models for regional languages is nobody bothered to collect the data and fund fund such activity. In all these other areas, because of the business nature of it, people actually fund uh, significant you know, part, parts of the, of the data required, like European Parliament mm -hmm. translation. However, <clears throat> assuming you raise about each country requiring that you learn that language, don't go away. I don't think in the future you need to learn any language or other than your own. And you'll be able to communicate with it. You just question to find the right app on the phone or the phone. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's why I would like to address uh, that it was a application. I'm an RGKD student. Uh, my question is, so nowadays we are moving towards the home system. So more specifically, I'm working on the aerial vehicles. So while you are dealing with the aerial vehicles, you are dealing with sensor. I'm going to send the data and followed by the algorithm. 
I have to think about this, you know, at this point, dealing with the complicated with complexity is not very clear. I, I will stop and uh, I have to unfortunately run. run. I have a Zoom call in an hour. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I now make the request, Chairman Sir and HODAI, to kindly felicitate Professor Han Reddy for sparing his valuable time and sharing indispensable knowledge with all of us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you next year with better help. And with this, I also thank one and all present here. Thank you. Have a good day. Bonte Sina.